Hi, I'm Colleen. I'm back. I'm interviewing Dr. Elise Kroll. She's a professor of philosophy at the City College of New York, uh, and she focuses on philosophy of physics and history and philosophy of science, and I'm really excited to be talking to you today. So thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me, Colleen. Okay, so I guess the first question I have, just a more general question, um, how did you get interested in philosophy, and more specifically, how did you get interested in the philosophy of science and the history of philosophy of science? Hmm. Great question. So I was raised by parents who encouraged us to ask why and what and how, just ask every question. And if my parents didn't know the answer, they would do a Kelvin and Hobbes and just make something up. Um, but it, it taught me to keep asking a lot of questions. And so when I studied physics as an undergrad, I loved the physics, but I found myself being drawn to the why for what reason and with what assumptions and when did this happen and who did it? Sort of historical and philosophical types of questions. And at the same time, I was enjoying my history and philosophy regular classes because I went to a liberal arts school in Michigan. Uh, and so I loved all these humanities courses and kept bugging my physics professors for more background on what I was learning. And they would give me some readings here and there. Uh, and then at some point, my, not till my junior year, I found out that history and philosophy of science was a discipline. And as soon as I found that out, I was like, that's it, that's me, that's where I wanna go. Uh, and so I was hooked. And I knew that that to be able to keep asking questions about the physics and keep learning the physics, but get to poke and prod in all these various ways with impunity was exactly what I wanted to do. So, yeah. oh, that's awesome. That's interesting. That's actually, quick aside, that's how I actually kind of got into philosophy of science and hobos. I, I wasn't in physics, but I was in chemistry and engineering. And I just like didn't really like the day-to-day -day activities. And I just liked the broader picture. And I took a philosophy of science class and a hobos class and was like, oh, perfect. So that's awesome. Yeah, I have a lot of STEM students in my classes who are just, they love being able to ask these questions about stuff they're learning in their STEM classes uh, from a more a practical endpoint, but they want to know the philosophical or the historical background. And, yeah, I love those students. I love having that. And I convert some of them to the dark side. <laughs> okay. Hey, probably need more. That's good. Um, <laughs> so you have a book that's coming out called The Einstein Paradox. Um, do you just want to tell me really briefly what this is about? And what was your motivation for writing it? Really anything you want to say about the book? That's really exciting that you're writing a book. It is written. It's, it's... Oh, okay. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. It's still like we're still working on copyright stuff, but it was a long project. So back when I was a graduate student, I took history and philosophy of quantum mechanics with Don Howard, who is my PhD advisor and also a big Hopos, uh, friend of Hopos and practitioner of Hopos. And he gave me a manuscript that Heisenberg had written in 1935, in which Heisenberg is making a philosophical case for why quantum mechanics is completely correct and incomplete of both. Namely, like Einstein and others thought, well, surely it's statistical. The laws are statistical. There must be some way that it's incomplete, that we can make it a complete theory in the way that thermodynamics is a complete theory uh, or relativity is a complete theory. And so, of course, a lot of the main like physicists at the time, Bohr, Born, Heisenberg, Schrodinger, Einstein, they were writing each other a lot of letters and thinking about these questions sort of behind the scenes. And here was this manuscript that Heisenberg had written, but never published. And he sent it to Pauli. Um, and it was so interesting. And I was just learning German at the time. So I started translating it. I learned German to translate this. And, um, and I just found there was so much going on behind the scenes. And at the same time, Guido Bacciagalupi, who was another big fan of Hopos and HBS, um, discovered a whole folder in the archive for the history of quantum physics the AHQP, that had Schrodinger's collection of letters called the Einstein Paradox. He had written the Einstein, you know, the Einstein Paradox on this folder, and inside was all this correspondence where they're having these philosophical and physical discussions about the meaning of quantum mechanics. And so we started collaborating together, uh, and the book is coming out of that. So part of the book is the first ever English translation of a lot of this primary source which was so much fun. Oh, that's super exciting. Yeah, it's a good look at 
that. Uh, and then and then we accompanied it with a few other like relevant like published stuff at the time, but now it's in the context because now you see like the arguments the physicists are having behind the scenes. And then also um Guido and myself have written a couple chapters that give historical philosophical context to all this new source material. So that is the book. Wow, that sounds yeah. really interesting. Oh my gosh. I'm gonna buy that book when it comes out. That's really did you I guess I don't know. What like what do you have like a favorite part of working on that project, I guess? You know what? There there are so many pieces that were great about it. I mean sometimes like sometimes Guido and I would spend a whole afternoon sitting outside with a cappuccino arguing about the west best way to translate a particular sentence. And I know that sounds insane, but there was something wonderful about it. Uh, I also loved getting into the archives because I am in a philosophy department and I consider myself primarily a philosopher, but on the face of it, like doing this historical work was just so important for philosophical analysis. And so getting to put on my historian hat yeah. was really fun. Um, but yeah, I think just getting just sitting for 10 years, because we've been working on this project for 10 years in in that space. It's really, it's really fun to watch these new connections emerge and these new ideas emerge. So it's hard to pinpoint one fun thing, but uh, the really small nerdy details like, you know, arguing over a German sentence and the big scale, like, wow, these are how schools were moving and how teachers were uh, teaching. And this is how the war in fact uh, impacted things. and. So much going on. It's a very rich episode in history and philosophy of science. Yeah, that sounds super fascinating. I guess I didn't realize how much like debate is going on behind the scenes. That's that's really cool that you're able to kind of uncover that. Yeah. yeah. Do you think there was any, I mean, I guess other than the length of time, is there any like really, really unique challenges do you think to writing a book of that kind of magnitude as opposed to writing a paper, even like with or without collaborators? They're just totally different beasts, um, as you can imagine. I mean, they're both really incredibly hard work, um, but a book project feels more like a child <laughs> in a way. Like you really come to know this material. And because we're in interdisciplinary fields, you really do have to have a good handle on each of those fields. And to do that with integrity is a very, excellent challenge, but a real challenge, a substantial challenge. And so that's one of the reasons that HOPOS and HPS, like having the communities of collaboration that they do is a natural and beautiful thing because it's just not the kind of scholarship that, that one genius off in a room is doing. And I think that's true in philosophy too. Like the old school philosophers, you get this impression, even as a student, that they're these you know white guys sitting in a room like being fed their food through a slot and they're just thinking but that's not true of their history um we know that but it's also not true of how real and good philosophy is done so it's even the way i write articles which tend to be more about the philosoph uh, philosophical aspects and books tend to be more of the history stuff right um i find that i'm better at pitching um, arguments in a certain way, just because I have this interdisciplinary perspective. Um, so yeah, they're both, I didn't answer your question very well, I suppose. Oh, that's a great answer. I'm not very fast at doing this kind of research. Um, and it just, it, interdisciplinarity takes a lot of time to do well. Uh, and there's a lot of pressure to pump out publications, I know. But um, that is something you have to resist because it's something worth doing well. Yeah, I think I imagine too, it'd be really challenging to like have such a difficult and like interesting, but incredibly difficult and challenging kind of book project going on in the background of everything else you're doing too. Yeah, I imagine that would be hard to balance at points. It is. I think that's one of the things you figure out pretty quick is, I mean, I love teaching and I knew that from the beginning. Um, but I, I didn't expect to love research as much as I do. But you find ways to balance those things. And 
I think it has made me a better writer and researcher. I just know how to manage my time and manage my projects so much better. Um, I was fortunate enough to have three years where I was just a research postdoc, no teaching, no publication requirements. Like I just got to sit and read and study. But <laughs> looking back, I, I know so much more about how to research now that I'm also teaching classes and interacting and there's kind of a a lively engagement that keeps your mind going in different directions all the time, which yeah is a little a little tricky, but it also brings a lot of new insights to to things. Uh, my students will make me explain something that I thought I kn knew how to explain well, and that ends up working its way into my papers or whatever. So yeah, it's definitely not easy, but it's really I mean I get to do things I love, so <laughs> it's worth. Absolutely. Yeah. So since you do quite interdisciplinary research, you know, you study things between the links, excuse me, you study things like the links between ethics and emergent science and technology, the perception of science and technology in the public sphere, things like that. It seems like, you know, you focus on, so you get to focus on so and work on so many different types of projects. Uh, do you have like a particular favorite subject, I guess? I don't know, that might be hard to pick. Well, I, I should start by saying disclosure i mean i i do teach a little bit of science technology and ethics like in in my classes but i don't actively research ethics and um there are many people who are doing excellent um work in like science technology and ethics and i do not count myself among them um, but i read their work with enjoyment um but I do think a lot about science in the public sphere, and I've given lots of talks that are sort of about science and religion and that interface, or just how we understand uh, science and technology from our particular perspective as 21st century Americans in the academy. Um, and I do enjoy those discussions a lot because even professionals, you know, my colleagues who are in STEM fields, don't always get the opportunity to sit and be met about what they do and how they teach um, and think about what science, what science claims to be and whether it lives up to those expectations. So I do love that kind of back and forth, but if I really could just pick one thing to do for the rest of my life, it would be to just think about space, time, and gravity in a cabin in the mountains somewhere. <laughs> so yeah, the philosophy, the philosophy of like quantum gravity and where we're moving in cosmology these days, I find so fascinating. I just wish I had more hours to think about those very specific questions. Yeah, that sounds really interesting. I don't, I actually don't, I don't know that much about that field. Is there like a particular big question that you find really interesting in that? Or is like all of them? I don't know if that's a- There are many, um, but I think, I mean, there's still so much we don't understand about entanglement, which Schrodinger says in the paper in 1935, when he coins the term, or shrank, like entanglement, he says, this is not one, but the characteristic trait that makes quantum mechanics different from all classical theories. Um, so it is the defining feature, and yet it is such an elusive concept in many ways, partly because the experiments we do in laboratories that deal with entanglement are unintuitive. Um, they don't comport with our macroscopic or like messy everyday um, understanding of the world with cups and tables and chairs and planets. Um, but at the same time, uh, most of these experiments that reveal strange entanglement relations also um, are not fully relativistic in certain ways. Like our how we think about the timestamps of different events in the lab are still from our like time asymmetric perspective. And so I've been thinking more these days about certain um, experiments like the legate gargan inequalities that are supposed to give us a cutoff between the quantum and the classical using time and entanglement across time. Um, and it's really messy terrain and I can't wait to, to dig into it a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, sounds really interesting. <laughs> I guess, and my next question is kind of like, so if you, once you like know you have a topic you wanna to research more, write about, do you have a particular way you go about it or a general writing style you work with? Man, so there are some, here, here's my, what I've learned to do. And it's taken a lot of years to figure this out. And I am not the one who discovered them. Other people have to understand this. 
The first thing is you really can't do this kind of work, research and writing for more than four hours a day because your mind just stop, like you're just not productive. No. And so even when I'm not teaching in the summer, that's my goal. Four hours, not administration, not goofing around or printing articles, but like writing or reading. Four hours is the max. And then once I've hit it, I let myself go because as an academic, there's always more you could do and you want to do, but you have to live your life well and take care of yourself, especially now that everything is in our apartments and our homes, right? Like those sorts of boundaries become crucial and your mind just, you will burn out if you don't intellectually care for yourself that way. So I think that's my big one. Um, I think those of us who are in interdisciplinary fields, we, we have a hunger to read and to read from all the different disciplines who are contributing to a topic. And you can read forever. And I know this is especially true of the women I've spoken to. Our tendency is to want to think we have to have read everything ever written about a particular question before we can contribute to the discussion. And that's just not the case. And so learning to have the confidence that I can jump in and join the discussion without having definitive and complete um, views about all those questions, but just some way that I think I can constructively move the discussion forward. To stop reading and start writing is is an act of confidence. Um, and, uh, and so learning to do that quicker and just to even practice writing in reading iterations that are faster, I learned during my dissertation, right? You can't, at some point, you just have to start writing. Um, and you write and you write and you start to find out that even if you toss most of what you wrote, that that act of typing it out or writing it out by hand, which I did a lot of, uh, causes you to see it from a new perspective or causes you to articulate it in a new way. And it's, a, it's such a, an important part of the process that I never expected. I thought you read a bunch of stuff, you come up with your argument, you write it down, but it's just much more back and forth and forward and backward and also just more interesting process than sitting and reading than sitting and writing. So. Yeah, that's very good advice, I guess. And this kind of goes into my next question. Um, my last question, if it's okay with you. Um, so do you have any like big piece of advice you would give to anybody who's kind of early in philosophy or thinking they might want to do philosophy? That is such a good question. Um, I think I want to speak to I know that the pressure to publish and to look good on paper is intense. And um, as someone who's transitioning from junior to less junior in my career, um, I, you really have to check in with yourself and say, do I still, like, I, do I genuinely care about this research project? Is this a question that it motivates me? Because even if you can publish a bunch, if you're not genuinely motivated, what are you doing? If you're just doing it to get pubs, then your whole career is going to be because your early publications set you forward on your journey. And of course, you change that journey many times, but it, it's the beginning profit process of you owning who you are as a scholar. And if a piece of that ownership is not saying, like, I'm genuinely fascinated by these questions, um, then I think it will be a really hard slog because it's a hard slog anyway. <laughs> Um, and if you don't have that, you're like, you know what, at the end of the day, as, as horrible as certain seasons, like this pandemic and everything is, if at the end of the day, you don't genuinely think that you belong doing like you, there's nothing else you would rather do than research and collaborate and teach. Um, then you're in the right place. And that's a good sign. And that's good confirmation that no matter how hard it is, it's worth going on. Right. Um, but yeah, you've got to love it. You've got to love it. Um, so that sounds very idealistic, but I think it's possible. And I think we would have a lot better publications if people weren't so pressured to publish just to publish and instead were really genuinely fascinated in what they do. <laughs> uh, no, I agree with you. I think it's so, I don't know, it seems so easy to, I mean, obviously like I'm super, super early in doing philosophy. I've only been doing it for like, I think this is my second full year of studying it. Um, but yeah, I could see how the, the pressure could be incredibly difficult to navigate at points. But yeah, it's important to love what you do. I don't think that's, I don't know. I don't know if that's stressed enough always. I think, I mean, 
mean, I stress this with my students who are applying for graduate schools. It's like, yes, intellect is important. Yes, being prepared for graduate school is important. But one of the most important things is just tenacity, determination. And where do you get that from? If not from, I mean, maybe it's to be really famous, but I feel like there are easier ways like via Instagram or something. I don't know. I don't have the Instagram, but that's what the kids do. This would be a really weird route to try to get very famous. Yeah, it is not the obvious route. I was like, I know what. I shall be a philosopher of science. Yeah. That would be how I make money. Right. But that's one of the reasons this field is great is because it tends to be populated by people who are genuinely interested in the questions they want to do and have trained in like different disciplines. Um, but yeah, tenacity and like your tenacity is if it comes out of a genuine love and a purposefulness, like knowing this is a life trajectory, not just an end goal, but like the whole journey is something worth doing. Uh, I think committees at the graduate level, like they see that, they see that, they definitely see that. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. That's very good advice. Yeah. I hope so. Yeah, that's all the questions I had for you. Um, that went so fast, Colleen. No, I know, that went very fast. Yeah.